I welcome you back once again to Pastor B's Kitchen Table right here. It's the spot where we break it down and chop it up and put it back together again for the glory of God. And you know that over the past months, we've been dealing with issues related to a relationship. We've talked about how to rightly relate when it comes to conflict. We've talked about how to rightly relate when it comes to marriage. we talked about how to rightly relate when it comes to dating. We've even talked about relating when you're parenting a prodigal. And there's many, many more to come. I'm going to be dealing with the issue of manhood and how we raise men and I'm going to talk about being a black man and, and what does it mean to be to be black and all we cursed. I'm going to Talk about issues that related to just just how do we navigate these waters uh, of cynicism uh, and, and cronyism. And so we're going to be talking about all those kind of things in the weeks to come. I'm going to have guests to come in and join me because I want, to, I, I want you to get a plethora of ideas of people and concepts that point us back to the Word of God of how we can have success in the very place we failed before, and that is in the relationship. We do a great, great job talking about relationship. However, when it comes to walking out our relationship, many of us have had problems after problems, and many of our relationships are DOA. They're dead on arrival. But God desires something greater. But today I want to just for a moment, because I'm going to have guests next week, but today I want to steal away for a moment and just uh, raise up an issue that was raised up for me at our corporate Bible study last night. Had a wonderful time in corporate Bible study right here at Friendship Community Bible Church with a place to begin again. Had a great, great study time. And someone raised a question about what do you do when you feel like that somehow God uh, is not answering your request. When it seems like the grass is greener on the other side. Because some of your relational desires are not being met. When it seems like that you desire to be married and yet there's no one who's desirous of marrying you. When it's saying that you're desirous of having children. But there's no one seem to be willing to have children along with you. Whenever your desire is to, to, to be an individual who wants to enjoy all the pleasures and the fun and the niceties of life, but it seems like that somehow that God is a, is a perpetual killjoy and he's trying to steal your fun and rob you of your right for duty. And your eye has begun to wander to the other side of the fence and maybe doing it that way may not be the right way, but maybe doing it that way may produce some fruit that can soothe my hurting heart. Have you ever felt that way before? Oh, go get your mom and them, go get your dad and them and pull up a chair. Because I know there's someone right now watching me, and that's where you are. You understand what the Bible says. You understand what God said. But you got some things inside of you, inside your psyche, inside your heart, that are pulling you to say, well, maybe I should just go over and venture on the other side of the fence and get my needs met or get my, <laughs> get my thirst quenched or get, uh, or get my, my sore spot scratched. And you're saying that right now, and, and you've convinced yourself there's nothing really wrong with that. Because after all, God doesn't seem to be doing anything. So what do you do when you find yourself like that? I just want to talk to you for a little bit because you're not the first people to ever do that. I believe there are some areas of our lives in which we have decided that we're just going to be the captain of our own ship. There are some parts in our lives that we don't want God, God's people, God's man, God's woman. We don't want anybody to invade or intercept what we have in store for our own life. The Bible said that God has a plan for your life. And guess what? You got a plan for your life too. And unfortunately, many times that plan supersedes God's plan for your life. And so you begin to wonder, well, maybe it's not right. And maybe it won't be blessed, but maybe I can have a little fun before God shows up and pulls the rug from under me. You know what I'm talking about. And I want to just talk about four common areas that many times we don't want God's benediction. We don't want God's favor. We, we don't want God messing with this part of our lives. The first one is money. When it comes to going on the other side of the fence, the grass being greener, we really feel that when it comes to money, that this is my money. I worked for this. I labored for this. I saved for this. I'm not going to give it. I'm not going to share it. And I'm certainly not going to tithe it. It's our money. So we have a mindset that, you know what, God? 
I'm going to handle this my way. And many of you are doing very well. All of God's people are not broke. All of God's people don't have low credit scores. Of course not. You're doing very, very well. But the money is your money. And so you decide to handle your finances in this way, regardless of what God says, regardless of what God says about your bless and 100% belongs to him, you have a mindset that says, this is my money. And that's the way you govern your life. That's another one of those green grass syndromes. You think that somehow if I govern myself, I will recession-proof my life. And that's not a reality, but that's not all. Also, we don't want God interfering and God getting in the way when it comes to our time. You've got iPhones, iPads, you have everything. You have your month, you have your quarter, you have your year. In fact, you've got 2020 already mapped out because you're a time-conscious individual. But when it comes to time, it's just that. It's your time. You don't seem to can fit God anywhere into your counter. And, and, and if you do, it's always in short intervals. There's no time to pray. There's no time to worship. There's no time to serve. There's no time to come along and do a, a random act of kindness to someone in need. You're always in a time crunch carrying out your agenda and your needs because time is yours. You have a green grass syndrome. You say, hey, this is how the world operates. This is how I'm going to operate. It's a worldly mentality. It's how you allocate your time. That's not all. Also, when it comes to marriage. You want to talk about a worldly idea, a green grass syndrome concept when it comes to marriage. In fact, in this culture, we've actually redefined marriage. It's no longer just male and female. It's whatever makes me happy. It's, it's, it's whatever satisfies my need, whoever connects with me on the emotional level, that's all that really matters. And so if we connect, it doesn't matter that if we're male and male or female and female. It does not matter because we've defined marriage. We've made marriage in our very own image. So when it comes to marriage, and therefore, as I always say, we privatize our marriage. It's what we want. So therefore, since it's not God and it's yours, then when you get tired of it, you can discard it. And many of you have discarded to marry because you don't understand that although marriage was given to you, it's not for you. It's to be a witness to a watching world about the greatness and the glory of God. But when it comes to your marriage, the way you carry yourself, the way you conduct yourself, the choices you make in your marriage has nothing to do about God and more to do with you. What do you say? What do you want? And I'm saying that is a worldly concept. It's a green grass syndrome because you may be somehow feeling right now in my marriage relationship, I'm having a hard, hard time. I'm stuck. It's difficult. Maybe if I'd have married him and maybe if I'd have married her or maybe we wouldn't got married at all or maybe I'd do better just not being married. And I'm just saying you can't handle marriage your way. That's not God's way. And, of course, the last one, the fourth one, it's when it comes to the area of sex. You talk about a worldly mindset, a green grass syndrome. When it comes to sex, this is my body. I do what I want to do. What's the old song? It's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to. That's how we live. We live with I When it comes to sex, we live with a very freakish culture. We live in a very sensual, lascivious culture. We live in a culture right now that anything, anybody goes. And we have the same approach. We have so much uh, undisciplined behavior when it comes to the area of sex, which is a beautiful, wonderful thing, but only in the proper context that God has given it. But unfortunately, those who are married, and unmarried, when it comes to sex, have a worldly mentality. We're caught up in so many pornographic ideas and so many pornographic thoughts. And in fact, I've heard someone say that many times when there's big church conferences that are out of town, that the people that many times download or order some of the most pornographic movies are the believers who are staying there for the conference. Isn't that just appalling? But I understand how the flesh works. The flesh wants what it wants. But I'm saying that whenever we acquiesce, and we give ourselves to the very desires of our, of our flesh, then sex no longer becomes an instrument of glory and honor to God. It becomes something that's been dragged through the mud of the culture, and now we've redefined it and reshaped it to fit our own carnal cravings. So I've said simply that when it comes to sex, many times we feel like God is not coming through, so we have a worldly perspective. When it comes to our marriages, we feel like God's not coming through, so we're very worldly in our marriages. 
when it comes to our time, it's our time. It's the right time. And so we just feel like it's our time. And when it comes, oh, Lord, when it comes to our money, it's our money. Don't touch it. Don't ask for it. Don't, you're not going to borrow it. It's mine, all mine. And so I want you to know today that you're not the first one. You're not the only one that feel that somehow uh, God's holding out or that God won't satisfy. You're not the only ones who want to be like everybody else that felt that somehow because you came into the kingdom of God that now God is treating you as, as, as if you are less than. Uh, it also happened in the Bible. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you get your Bible when you get home, read it. 1 Samuel chapter 8, you'll see that in fact, uh, God has delivered his people. He brought them through so much. He brought them out of Babylonia. He brought them out of Egyptian captivity. He brought them into the promised land. And then, then Joshua dies. And then he brings them through the whole period of judges. And then he raises up Samuel to be a prophet. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, the text says that in fact, the elders come to Samuel and say, make this statement, is that uh, we want to appoint a king to judge us like all the nations. They're saying, you know what, Samuel, God's blessing been good, God's favor been good, but we've been looking around, and it looks like that the other folks are more blessed than we are. That they seem to be having fun, enjoying their lives, and here we are suffering. Therefore, therefore, we want to be a people who have someone over, we want to look just like them. And so the Lord tells Samuel, because it broke Samuel's heart, the Lord tells Samuel in verse 7, says, listen, Samuel, uh, I heard the voice of the people, but understand, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me from being king over them, because they said, we want a king. We want to be like everybody else. And he said, they've rejected you, preacher. Man of God, woman of God, they rejected you. They rejected God. Parent is trying to raise their child in the way of the Lord. Someone, a grandparent trying to raise their grandchild in the way of the Lord. They reject you. They rejected the God in you and what you're saying, what you're trying to do. I need to encourage somebody's heart there because some people are so frustrated. And I'm saying that you're doing the right thing. You're saying the right thing. But they rejected God. And then God proceeds in verse 10 all the way through verse 18, talking about, now, if you go and be like them, if you go and get a king, if you go and acquiesce, if you go and have a worldly mindset, it's going to lead to bondage. That which you bring in, it's going to take authority over you. The king is going to take your children. The king is going to tax you. The king is going to run your household. The king is going to pillage and steal and rob from you. If you go and be like them, and that's always the way, that whenever we go into the world system, into a carnal brand of Christianity, or we go into that God not being fair, I got to go and get mine because I'm wise and I got sense, then it always brings in what you don't realize as part of the Trojan horse. It's bondage. There's always something hiding on the inside. And what's hiding on the inside is bondage. And so this is what they said, though. They said in verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, But no, there should be a king over us. We want to be what? Like all the other nations. Stop right there. They're saying, I understand what you're saying, God. I understand what you're saying, preacher man. But we know what? I want to do what I want to do. I want to have money the way I want to have my money. I want to use my time the way I want to use my time. I want to deal with marriage the way I choose to deal with marriage. And I'm going to deal with my body to whatever feels freaky. And you're saying, but I want to do my own thing. And he's saying, they've rejected me. And they wanted a king, and they got a king. They got what they wanted. But be careful when you go and get what you want. Because when you go and get what you want, there'll come a day whenever you won't want what you got. Say that again. Be careful when you go and get what you want. There'll come a day in which you won't want what you got. Oh, if there was a return policy, and you know what I'm talking about. If you could just turn it back, God let them have this king named Saul, and he was a horrible king. He was a terrible king. He was a frightful king. He was a king who had personality disorders. He was a king that had a bad heart toward God. He was a king that always looked for a scapegoat. He was a king that would not fully follow God. Therefore, he could not fully lead God's people. And 
I'm saying today that God has a king. God raised up a man named David. was a man of God's own heart. But God had a perfect king because David was not a perfect king. But we have a king of kings, the Lord of lords, this is Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he will lead you. So what am I telling you today? I'm going to tell you to tell your mama and them, tell your daddy and them that the grass is not greener on the other side of the fence. In fact, somebody said it best. It ain't really grass at all. It's artificial turf. It just looks like grass. No, you stay in the way and the will of God. Wait for the Lord. He will come through. Wait for the Lord. He will show up. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So today, pick your head up. Pick your faith up. Pick your Bible up. Get up and walk with God. And I understand what you want. But the Bible also says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the very desires of your heart. May there be some delighting in your house, delighting in my house, delighting in your company, delighting in your cul-de-sac. May there be some delighting that God may bless you and bless you indeed. He's going to say, well, where do you learn all this at? Right here at Pastor B's kitchen table. I'm going to see you again. I'm going to see you soon. But I want to see you walking for the glory of God. May God bless you. May God keep you. And may God use you.